The human experience of enslavement and transportation across the Atlantic is not as much a part of the literature on the slave trade as it should be. It is in part a function of the sources, which are, after all, the records of a trade kept like any other in account books. And the literature fo focuses on the numbers. The New Voyages database deepens that pattern. And it's really only recently that, that historians have started to try to offer a subjective human history of the slave trade and what is called the Middle Passage, the period slaves spent as captives on the coast of Africa or in the holds of ships crossing the Atlantic. It's not easy to write that kind of history, but I do think we have to try because our reliance on the quantitative evidence risks the danger of further dehumanizing what are, after all, not numbers at all, but people turned into numbers as they were once converted into commodities and articles of exchange. It's what the novelist Barry Unsworth calls the violence of abstraction. So I think we need to look at the process that produced the numbers and try to pu pull back the veil, if you will, to see the kind of physical and social violence involved. In fact, the greed that tested the limits of the human capacity for suffering often right up to the point where life itself was extinguished. People sold into saltwater slavery to European traders were purchased in a whole series of transactions strung out sometimes over months. And in the meantime, they were held in the forts uh, on, on the islands or on the uh, coast or in the holds of ships idling off the coast on the water. And they were held in conditions of near starvation, rampant disease, and let's face it, abject terror. One British ship on the Gold Coast took five months and 22 separate transactions to get 100 people on board, still not a full cargo. So the period of captivity spent on the slave ships could be very long even as much as nine months total, given the time uh, that was spent on the coast and the difficulties of gathering the cargo. The Atlantic crossing itself could be a variable length, depending on the route. The shortest would be, uh, I'm sorry, the shortest would be six weeks, but the longest would be three months, and it was those long voyages that had the highest mortality rates. Angolans called the slave ships tumberos, floating tombs, and indeed they were. West African people bound for slavery in the Americas were carried across the Atlantic in the most dense configurations of any group transported by Europeans from the 16th century to the 19th century. Servants and conv convicts and famine immigrants endured conditions that had never before been encountered. But in sheer horror or awfulness, transportation history provides no parallel to the transatlantic slave ship. As I mentioned before, it was a business in which the British excelled in efficiency and in humanity. They carried 50% more people per tonnage of ship than the Dutch and the French. You can see one famous representation of that efficiency in the slave ship Brooks, an anti-slavery image introduced in England in the late 18th century to support the abolition of the slave trade. Slave ships, one historian has said, were a potent combination of war machine, mobile prison, and factory. Slaves were chained in the hold head to foot, as you see on that image, separated by sex and sometimes by age. As little as four foot was allowed per person. It was the point when the humanity of the subject was most muted. People were pushed to the limits of human endurance. Many died, some committed suicide. Resistance was always a possibility, but less so once the ship headed out into the Atlantic. The historian David Eltis says that the Middle Passage was probably, quote, the purest form of domination in the history of slavery as an institution. But still, there was resistance. There were some famous cases of slave resistance the Amistad mutiny, for example, in the 19th century, which is crucial in Afri African-American memory in the modern period, as you can see in this incredible mural from Talladega College. But resistance was also far more common than we previously assumed. It was actually the case in about one of every 10 vessels. 
It was so common that every captain of a ship had to be prepared to put down insurrection. And what this meant was that it forced the crews and the ship to be heavily armed and drove up the price of transporting slaves across the Atlantic. In a few cases, resistance was so significant that it forced the return of the ships to the coast of Africa. The pattern of resistance was, was uh, regionally uneven. It was far more likely in, in the Upper Guinea or Sen Senegambia region than in West Central Africa. And that's an interesting detail for sure. <clears throat> Mortality rates were very high at every point in the process. They had to do with the length of the voyage, but also the condition of people when they left the coast. As I said, they were kept in the forts and slave ships in conditions of near starvation. There was never enough food. And disease was rampant in the forts and the castles, but also on the holds of the ships on the coast and in the voyage. Ships were a breeding ground of disease, gastrointestinal and, uh, the, uh, and airborne pathogens, and slaves and crew alike were exposed to an incredible number of uh, diseases, smallpox and dysentery chief among them, from crowding, poor hygiene, and contaminated food and water. People in, uh, the people enslaved on the ships attempted to quiet fears of imminent death, but they had to do it with the specter of people dying around them. On one slave ship, the James, it carried 423 people and 51 died on the crossing. Overall mortality rates declined over time, but averaged about 10 or 12% over the length of the trade. 12 and a half million people were sold on the coast, but they did not all arrive on the other side. Nor did the prospect of death end when the ship hit land. A substantial number of people reached ports in the Americas only to die there, some within days. As many as half of the slaves brought across the Atlantic died within three years of walking off the slave ship. Richard Dunn, the historian, called it a demographic catastrophe. Slaves who endured these conditions were driven to the brink of death and every one of them exited the middle passage as a walking skeleton. It's little wonder that the slaves believed, as one told a priest in Cartagena, that the Spanish had carried them to this land to eat them or to make them into oil or gunpowder. You can see in that shard of testimony the psychological trauma involved in the middle passage. The historian Stephanie Smallwood emphasizes the narrative and cognitive or epistemological challenge of the experience for the people who lived through it. She says it involved a kind of indirect violence and she insists that it be taken into account. That proceeded from the inability of those sold into saltwater slavery to integrate the experience into any knowledge system that they possessed. They just simply had no way of making sense of what was happening to them. So they would explain sail into the Atlantic in the idiom of death. For those left behind, it became a common assumption that slaves had been eaten or murdered since no one ever returned home. And you, can already, you have already seen that slaves themselves sold into, the, uh, into slavery in the Americas embraced common, uh, the co commonly embraced the idiom of death. But the saltwater experience challenged even the cultural framework of death because the captives were denied the rights of death that in so many West African cultures closed the process by integrating the dead into the realm of ancestors. The slave ship put the people beyond the reach of their kin, physically and metaphorically. It is surely telling that when the ships docked in American ports, linguists would board to quiet the slaves and calm their fears and assure them that they would not be eaten once they were put ashore.